You're listening to a Roddenberry Podcast. This episode of Genealogy is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Protect yourself with the VPN that we use and trust. Use our link, expressvpn.com slash missionlog today, and get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash missionlog. Visit expressvpn.com slash missionlog to learn more. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. We'll have more news this evening, but first, the latest genealogy, a Roddenberry podcast. Episode 2, Wife Killer. Welcome into another episode of Mission Log Genealogy. I'm Norman Lau. And I'm Earl Green. This is a Roddenberry podcast, perhaps even the Roddenberryest podcast ever, since we're going back in time to the beginnings of Gene's career as a TV writer and the beginnings of TV writing as a career. This week, Wife Killer, or... Mr. District Attorney, TV 22B, which is not as dramatic. This is Gene's second script, still using the pseudonym Robert Wesley for Mr. District Attorney, dated April 26, 1954. I'll be back with trivia in a moment, but first, Norm's either going to read you your rights, or maybe he'll just tell you how you can reach us. Genealogy is meant to be entertaining and informative, but it's also just the beginning of an ongoing conversation about the works of Gene Roddenberry. Drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com and join us on Twitter and Facebook at Mission Log Pod. While you're at it, leave us a review and a rating at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Since we are deep diving into the historical archives, if you have any information regarding Gene's work, or if you have any details that can help us produce the most accurate historical account possible, please contact us also so we can make any corrections or additions if needed. And please remember your comments could be used on future installments of genealogy. And now, you have the right to remain silent and listen to Earl Green with this week's trivia. Thank you, Norm. With a final script draft dated April 26, 1954, mere weeks after the air date of defense plant gambling, Gene probably started on this script not long after its predecessor. The air day IMDb shows for the episode resulting from this script is September 30th, 1954, quite a while after Gene's first Mr. District Attorney episode, though keep in mind at this time, Gene is still moonlighting as a TV writer while he's serving in the LAPD. Who was in this episode? This is another area where things get hazy. All we know for certain is that David Bryan was in it, as he was Mr. District Attorney himself, playing the character of Paul Garrett. Born in the Big Apple in 1914, David had already dipped his toes into showbiz by way of vaudeville when his and everyone else's life was interrupted by World War II. He joined the U.S. Coast Guard and went back to acting on stage after the war. It was Joan Crawford who talked him into trying to make it big in Hollywood. They were in a number of movies together, and David was a regular fixture on the big screen through the early 50s. When TV became a thing, however, David became a fixture of the small screen as well, with one-off roles in a number of playhouse and anthology shows like Revlon Mirror Theater, Ford Television Theater, Celebrity Playhouse, Schlitz Playhouse, Alcoa Theater, Westinghouse Desi Lou Playhouse, and General Electric Theater. This is an entire genre of TV lost to time that we will circle back to fairly soon because Gene Roddenberry wrote for some of these shows as well. Interspersed with occasional movie roles, David Bryan also guest starred in TV shows such as The Untouchables, Rawhide, Death Valley Days, Laredo, I Dream of Jeannie, The Girl from Uncle, Mannix, Mission Impossible, Gunsmoke, and one of my favorite early 70s spy fi shows, Search. And yes, David Bryan did appear in Gene's future work, guest starring as John Gill, that misguided Federation historian who just wanted to keep the space trains running on time on the planet Ecos in the episode Patterns of Force. We lost David in 1993. But in 1954, as District Attorney Paul Garrett, David Bryan was TV's bastion of justice in Mr. District Attorney. What have you got on the Durant background? It was like investigating the Decency League. Lovely people. 
spotless background, well liked by their friends, and no enemies. What's their financial position? The wife has the money, I guess nearly 300000 an inheritance from her mother. The husband was very honest about that point. Any chance he needs money? I don't think so. She buys him everything he wants. Last month, three suits from Harper's, hand-tailored, a dozen $10 ties. She gave him a new car last Christmas, golf clubs for his birthday. No wonder he's crazy about this doll. Has he got any money of his own? Not much. It doesn't matter, though. She's a very generous woman. Maybe everything is as it seems to be in this case. We've got to hit an honest one sooner or later. Well, let's go talk to the Durants. Oh, no. This is your baby. You're the guy that takes an oath to protect suffering mankind. I only swore to handle crime. I don't blame you for not wanting to come. It'll be a tough one. I don't see how you got mixed up in it in the first place. When crime rears its head, District Attorney Paul Garrett is the man who organizes the law enforcement effort to stop it in its tracks and bring the criminals to justice. Act 1. In the quiet solitude of their bedroom, Tom and Olga Durant are fitfully asleep. Olga stirs in her slumber, her hand moving across the bed as if it's seeking something. A nearby dresser drawer creaks open and an ugly-looking knife is pulled forth. Falling footsteps on the floor are soon accompanied by the squeaking of bed springs, and the still silence inside the bedroom is pierced by a woman's scream again and again. Shortly after, a police unit arrives on the scene, 122 Western Drive. An unkempt Tom Durant, still in his bedclothes, answers the knock on the door. Two officers explain that they have been dispatched to the Durants to investigate a disturbance, specifically a woman screaming. At first, Tom is unwilling to let the officers inside, explaining that his wife simply had a nightmare. But the officers insist on speaking with Olga personally. Allowing the officers to enter his home, Tom steps aside to fetch his wife. After securing the room, the officers holster their weapons. Tom returns with Olga, who appears haggard and frightened. The police are concerned that she was, and still is in danger, perhaps under duress from an abusive husband. Olga convinces them that this is all just a misunderstanding caused by a nightmare. The two officers are somewhat wary of the situation, but call off any further units from arriving. As they leave, one of the officers continues to write the particulars of their findings in his notebook. Once the police are gone, both Tom and Olga drop the afore-acted pretense. Tom paces the floor, and Olga caresses her cheek while wiping away tears from her eyes. Tom apologizes for slapping her so forcefully, but asks his wife, What would you do if you woke up with someone standing over you with a knife? And reminds her that he was lucky to have stopped her this time. Olga can't bear to be taken away to a mental institution, but Tom pleads with her to reconsider because if her condition gets the better of her next time, she would suffer knowing that she brutally murdered her husband and she would be committed, which is Olga's greatest fear. The next day, Miss Olcott, private secretary to District Attorney Paul Garrett, bursts into his office explaining that Mr. Durant insists on seeing him on a most urgent and confidential matter. After dispensing with introductions and pleasantries, Durant cuts right to the chase. He explains that his wife is slowly going insane, that she doesn't trust the doctor's psychiatric evaluations, that she is terrified of being committed, but most importantly, she has an obsession with knives. The incident the night before was another example of Olga's mental instability, of which the Durants tried to hide from the police, albeit unconvincingly. Tom knows in his heart that Olga would never purposefully harm him, yet confesses to Garrett that he fears for his life, and that last night was the closest Olga got to actually doing him real harm. Garrett advises Durant to have Olga committed, but Tom pleads that there must be another way. Garrett, explaining that he has no jurisdiction over the Durants' personal affairs, insists that either Tom commit his wife or find her the proper medical care. As Durant leaves Garrett's office defeated, his helpless demeanor persuades Garrett to change his mind and take up Durant's case. Garrett wonders why did Durant come to him in the first place? Garrett needs answers, and the only way to get them is to hear Durant's whole side of the story. Durant explains that Olga has become increasingly more paranoid, hearing voices, thinking her food is poisoned, and fearing electrocution from objects around the house. Tom believes that Olga's shame from being committed would be devastating, but Garrett insists that she needs to be treated properly. 
Tom agrees, but also asks Garrett if he could be the one to persuade Olga to accept the doctor's order to seek clinical help. Tom thinks that the clout of the district attorney's office would persuade Olga to believe Garrett's word without question. He also informs Garrett that Olga's mind would be more at ease since her substantial personal wealth and legal rights would be protected by attorney-client privilege. Durant finally confesses that if anything should happen to his wife, he would inherit her money, which is why he was a bit cagey last night when the police arrived to investigate and suspect that foul play may have been involved. Tom also admits that Olga has no motive against him. Now, all of the cards are on the table. With the big picture well in hand, Garrett makes an appointment for Olga to be evaluated by Dr. Mayfair of the police hospital division. In Dr. Mayfair's office, Olga Durant is subjected to a series of fairly standardized psychiatric tests. During her initial questioning, she's easily distracted by the doctor's letter opener, hypnotized in fact, a specific note the doctor makes in his ledger. Next, her reactions to the Rorschach tests confirm levels of emotional distress. Finally, a battery of specific questions probe Olga's emotional subconscious for any signs of a violent or twisted nature to which Garrett observes with special intent. He needs to know how these thoughts could have fractured her mind where both a loving wife and a cold-blooded killer can coexist. Back in his office, Garrett receives disturbing news from Dr. Mayfair as Lieutenant Klingham, an old friend, stops by to deliver a background report on the Durants. Klingham tells Garrett that they are a model couple. Olga has taken incredibly good care of her husband to the tune of expensive hand-tailored suits, new cars, golf clubs, and other lavish gifts of which Tom himself could not afford. But Garrett is still suspicious about this whole affair and decides to bring Klingham along for the ride, literally, as they head out to see the Durants with the intent of taking Olga away for further medical observation. Act 2. At the Durants, Olga is noticeably aggravated with Garrett and Klingham's visit. Garrett tells Olga that Dr. Mayfair's evaluation is inconclusive, but also reminds the Durants that Mayfair is the final and official authority regarding Olga's mental health. Klingham silently observes the Durants as Garrett continues questioning. Olga isn't sure whether her current state of mind has placed Tom's life in danger, but has no explanation why she's become so dangerous to her husband, especially at night, when she's been caught in precarious situations with a knife in hand. Garrett is firm with Olga and tells her she must address her mental health needs with extreme seriousness. However, as the conversation becomes increasingly tense, Tom pauses the proceedings and offers his guests some refreshments, giving Olga a moment to collect herself. Since their servant Cora has been previously let go, Olga leaves to fetch the drinks and is literally shocked when she tries to open the kitchen door. However, when Garrett touches the doorknob, there's nothing. Further proven when Tom walks through the same door without incident to fetch Olga something to calm her. He returns with a glass of milk, which she reluctantly drinks and quickly chokes on it, claiming that it burns her throat. Tom drinks from the same glass and, just like the doorknob, nothing. Olga, feeling like she has no other choice, decides to pack a bag so she can be taken to the hospital. Once again, Garrett feels something is off and asks Tom to help Olga pack. When they disappear upstairs, Garrett takes the residue-filled drinking glass and leaves, but not before giving Klingham instructions to let the Durants know he washed and put away the glass in question. Back in the office, Garrett is interrupted by Miss Olcott, who has Klingham on the phone with urgent news. Klingham reports that Olga escaped his custody when they stopped at a nearby drugstore to pick up some personal things, and that Tom is beside himself with anger at the whole situation. Sometime after placing an all-points bulletin out on Olga, Garrett is surprised by a most unexpected visitor. Olga walks into Garrett's office holding a knife, one that she found in her bag while at the drugstore. She claims she's never seen it before and wants it examined for other fingerprints, as she said she's never touched it. Garrett promises to look into it and proceeds to take her to the hospital. Later that evening, Garrett and Klingham receive news that the fingerprints on the knife aren't Olga's. Klingham thinks that they are Tom's, but Garrett says that doesn't prove anything. To complicate matters, the remnants inside the glass that Garrett had examined by the lab was plain salt. Just then, Garrett receives a phone call from Tom Durant who explains that somehow the milk he poured for his wife and the entire bottle of milk in his refrigerator were both heavily loaded with salt. Klingham shoots Garrett a sideways look, believing that Tom knows that the drinking glass was missing from the house. Without any conclusive evidence, the pair decide to take their investigation back to the Durants' home since both Tom and Olga are away together at the hospital. 
Shortly after arriving at the Durants, both Garrett and Klingham have the same idea to closely examine the doorknob that supposedly shocked Olga's hand. Garrett takes apart the doorknob's hardware to find it strangely wired. Klingham literally shocks Garrett with his discovery, a hidden foot switch underneath the living room rug, and one that is easily activated by stepping on it if one knew how to do it inconspicuously and at the right time. Believing that Olga is in danger, the two race to the hospital and call ahead to make sure Olga is placed under protective observation by a nurse. When they arrive at the hospital, Garrett and Klingham rush towards the entrance and are spotted by Tom and Olga, who are leaving at the same time. Tom whisks Olga back to their house, telling her all the while that Garrett was at the hospital with a warrant for her arrest, that he isn't on her side and was to lock her away for good. As Olga's mind swirls from this betrayal, Tom suddenly pulls a knife from underneath a couch cushion and accuses Olga once again that she in some way was planning on murdering him. Forcing her to take the knife from him, Olga finally comes to the realization that Tom wants her to get her fingerprints on the knife so he can finally do what he's been planning all along, to kill her and make it look like it was self-defense. She refuses to give him to Tom's demands, but is finally cornered when he pulls out a small caliber handgun. Tom is distracted by the screeching arrival of Garrett's car. It turns out that he was tipped off by one of the hospital's nurses who reported Olga was checked out by none other than her husband. Tom hides the gun and calmly greets Garrett and Klingham as if everything is normal. Tom tries to convince the two lawmen that they arrived just in time and that Olga was once again armed and dangerous. Olga stands by, utterly silent and despondent. Believing that he has convinced Garrett that Olga has planned to kill him all along, Tom obliges Garrett's request to fetch the DA all of the knives from the kitchen. But as his hand reaches for the kitchen doorknob, Tom hesitates as Garrett clearly steps on the hidden floor switch that he and Klingham discovered earlier. Knowing that he's been discovered, Tom pulls out his gun, points it at Garrett, and orders him to deactivate the switch. Garrett does so, and as Tom tries to escape through the kitchen door, he's met with a nasty shock which causes him to drop the gun, allowing Klingham to subdue Tom and for Garrett to secure the gun. Garrett confesses, I didn't hit the switch the first time. As Klingham escorts Tom out in handcuffs, he confesses that he was tired of the societal and personal humiliation of being a kept man, a man whose dignity was sullied by a woman who afforded him all of the finer things in life. But all Tom believed was how he was perceived by others as being a man who couldn't provide for himself. Garrett charges Tom with attempted murder and makes one fact very clear, that Tom is getting off easy with a 10-year sentence for attempted murder. The shock he received from the doorknob was nothing in comparison to the quarter million volts he would have received from the state's electric chair. The end. Excellent job, Norm. And, you know, while you were reading that, the thought occurred to me. Klingham. Okay, so last week we had Sergeant Riker. This week we have Lieutenant Klingham. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm thinking back to the first time the Klingons showed up in uh, Gene's future work. And and if you remember, at that time, they were the Klingons. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm wondering, is this another case where Gene's just going through his Rolodex to name stuff? When I was reading through the the recap, every time I said it, it just kind of popped into my head. Like, phonetically, it's so close. I don't see why not. And maybe, maybe the person that he's thinking about, you know, about Lieutenant Klingham as a, as an actor, maybe it was this larger kind of, I don't know, like, again, an ethnic type character. Who knows? I'm pretty sure we're going to be discovering like a lot of these things throughout the course of like breaking down the scripts, you know, seeing character names, character descriptions, stuff like that. But speaking of breaking down scripts, when I was breaking down this script, the first thing that it kind of struck me funny On the title page, it just says, Mr. District Attorney TV 22B. And there's no title, like Wife Killer, that we just mentioned, you know, specifically earlier, on the title page. Why is that? Did they name the episode after? (laughs) Were there actually, because was it on like one of the the credit, you know, the the credit screen, you know, scenes right before the episode started? I mean... Why isn't there a, a title to the script? That's a good question. And it, it really kind of made me wonder if maybe the titles didn't happen after the show was done. Like, basically, you know, hey, promo department, would you come up with something to call this? You know, that, that new TV guide magazine? They're asking for stuff like this. Come up with something. Uh, there really I, is no universal standard for 
how to handle episode titles because I mean even now you have incredibly involved titles that never show up on screen it's like why even have them why not just call it season 2 episode 12 it, mm-hmm. why go through the trouble it's enough to make the lambs cry while they're touching the sky do you know what I'm talking about <laughs> oh I know exactly what you're talking about you know, that's the funny thing though like when I, and I know we're going to get to like other episodes like or other series like you know Have Gun Will Travel and Lieutenant later on but even when I watch those episodes and even in the radio dramas, there isn't a title. So it's just you just watch the episode for what it is rather than have maybe a an expectation from the actual title. So you're not subverted too early or have a preconceived notion of, of what the episode may or may not be. Because that's exactly, say, what it – unless it's an obscure title like, you know, um, Magic That Makes the Lambs Cry Go Mad or something like that. Yeah, and I – kind of wonder if the episode title was a retroactive thing that happened after it aired because if you think about it this this is the worst episode title ever it totally gives away the twist you might as well say the butler did it which actually sounds like something <laughs> it sounds like something from police squad again we keep going back to police squad and and we're not done talking about police squad either no, we are not. I'm not even going to – you teed me up for that. I'm not even get there yet. You know, in, in, in the process of breaking this down, uh, I, many of you know, uh, if you've listened to Mission Log in general, that uh, what John and I do, we take a script or a take a series episode and then we break it down. And it's really much easier, I think, to do it, you know, when you have a lot of visual cues, you know, in place when you're watching an episode, breaking it down act by act. This was really hard. I mean, this was really difficult. And I can't imagine how much more difficult it would have been, say, back in the 1950s when Gene turns in this script and then all of a sudden a director has to break it down and interpret the writer's notes and block the scene and set the budget and find the the scene locations, of which I'll get to in a second. I mean, when you broke down the first episode script, when you broke down uh, Defense Plant Gambling... Was it difficult for you? I mean, do you think it's just going to be like that kind of, we have to really just pour over the script over and over and over again just to make sure that we get the right beats? Kind of, sort of, but also kind of not, because one of the things I used to do professionally as a TV promotions writer-producer, I used to write end credit voiceovers for our local station. And so you'd have to summarize stuff really succinctly and kind of get to the heart of it and usually because there wasn't time to watch literally every show that came down the pike you know you would have a synopsis supplied by the network the program distributor whoever and then you would have to boil that down even further to just the bare essence of it although i always made it my policy boil it down to the bare essence but don't give away the story you know leave the viewer a reason to watch Hence, maybe not putting the title in, you know, in front of the the title card in front of the episode. Yeah, yeah. Tonight's episode, Wife Killer. Oh, did we say that already? But <laughs> did I say that out loud? But yeah, it's there. There's kind of an art form to it, and I feel like as you get more accustomed to looking at words on a page instead of watching a show, you'll get the fever for the flavor of it. I wanted to like touch really quickly on something I, I just thought was funny. You know, if I were like breaking down the script and, and it was given to me as kind of like a location scout, this is what I call set design on the really, really cheap. So on scene 28, it says exterior general hospital day silence. So there's no scoring, you know, there's no voiceover. And then the description is we see the top of the hospital camera pans down to the building, to the bottom of the floor entrance, then camera pans across the entry walk to the street. We see the Durant automobile, specifically large and expensive, pull up at the curb. The Durants exit and walk towards the hospital entrance. This is what cracks me up. If no hospital, quote unquote, sign in the background, at least one extra nurse in uniform should provide background. That's it. Just have like one like white smocked person walk by and like, of course, it's a hospital. We don't even have to make a hospital sign. It's just the shorthand. Maybe that saved like a lot in production value. But then again, they had to get like a a large expensive car. For the Durant, so hospital sign or a large expensive car. So I, I just, I don't know. Did it strike you funny? It, I thought that was funny. I hope that I find like funny things later on in other scripts. Uh, I thought that the fact that a single nurse is a shorthand for a whole hospital, I, I felt that mm-hmm. Gene was <laughs> definitely looking into the future of, you know, overworked healthcare professionals, you know, understaffed healthcare facilities. Yeah, one nurse. 
That's the whole hospital. One nurse. That's why Tom was able to get away with Olga so quickly. Speaking of expenses, so in, in police procedurals, you know, it's a far gone tradition that uh, money equals motive and lots of money equals lot of motive. So there's, there's a, a detail that says that Olga's inheritance was around $300,000 from her grandma. So uh, I put this in the calculator because Google is pretty much my brain, pretty much a lot of people's brains nowadays. $300,000 in 1954 is the equivalent in purchasing power to about $3,409,000 in today's dollars over 69 years. The dollar had an average inflation rate of 3.5% per year between 1954 and today, producing a cumulative price increase of 1,036.4%. So, that is a lot of cheeseburgers there, man. So if you were Biff Tannen, that's the reason why you would want to steal a time machine and invest. I'll be honest with you. I'd be happy just with the 300 large. 300 large is still a lot of money. But as you can see from this detail, why Tom Durant is this kept man. I mean, there's really nothing that she couldn't afford him. You know, the, the lavish, uh, the clothes, they're, they're bespoke. You know, the, the, the golf clubs. Uh, I'm sure that with golf club comes a very lucrative golf club membership somewhere. I mean, these are high society marks, you know, marks of, of, of being a, a wealthy person in high society. So, They're status symbols. Yeah, I mean, it sets the stage. Status symbols, thank you. Part of me thinks the plotting of this episode is a little bit on the hokey side. A hidden floor switches feeding current to doorknobs and salted milk and so on. But then I remember our conversation last week about how your drama categories on TV at this time are cop shows, westerns, and war dramas. Mm -hmm. Medical dramas are just starting to become a thing around this time. Legal dramas are not their own category yet. They're a, you know, they are like Mr. District Attorney. They're a subset of the cop shows. And there are so many of these three categories of shows on per week. And Dragnet at this time is still way out in front setting the pace. You, you know, now I say way out in front. It's going to be a few years before they are pretty high and far out. I guess it may take something kooky like the plot for this episode to break through the clutter and kind of get people's attention, even if from a 2023 standpoint, it's like, wow, really? The, uh, the direction for that scene when, when Garrett steps on the, the switch just to fake out you know, Tom Durant, it says you know, he does it very pronouncedly so that Tom would see it. It would have been so funny to see, like, this guy who's all he's you know he's just standing there and stamps his foot on the floor like look what I did ha 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 <laughs> you know? but it's weird I didn't read ahead when I was doing my notes and when I when I read the whole thing about the salt and the milk I thought that he was trying to increase her sodium intake so that she would create a bigger static charge when she would touch the doorknob and all of you doctors out there are like no Norm that's not how it works but that's how that's where mine was my mind was going it, it had nothing to do with there's like he's sitting there by his couch or standing off to the side and like, oh, she's going to go for the doorknob. I think I'll stand over here and tap my foot. You know, all you have to do is add a line of dialogue about her doctor has told her to cut down on sodium, you know, immediately. And then suddenly the salt is a plot point. But I can't tell if we're overthinking it or underthinking it. We'll get right back to Wife Killer after a word from this week's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Now, you just heard probably a voice you haven't heard in a while, certainly not on this show. And this is exactly why you need ExpressVPN, because it protects you from unwanted visitors. Well, John's not an unwanted <laughs> visitor, but you know what I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm you know an interloper. I mean. I, I'm the <laughs> unexpected guest who just crashes because I can. <laughs> John crashed in and he breached our security. And this is exactly the reason why you want ExpressVPN, because it's the best VPN on the market. And here's why. All right. Well, uh, we trust ExpressVPN because, well, first and foremost, ExpressVPN doesn't log your activity online. Now, now think about this. The whole point in having a VPN service is to hide your tracks, make sure that you are safe and secure using the Internet, particularly when you're in public spaces and you're using uh, sensitive apps or transmitting sensitive information. And get this, a lot of the cheap or free VPNs out there on the market, they make their money 
by selling your data back to advertisers. Imagine that. It defeats the whole purpose of having the VPN in the first place. But ExpressVPN does not do this. They've even developed a technology called Trusted Server that makes their VPN servers incapable of storing any data at all. That's that's the best case scenario right there. The other great benefit of ExpressVPN is it is fast. ExpressVPN now uses Lightway, a new VPN protocol that they engineered to make user speeds faster than ever. Now, I have tried other VPNs, and uh, it is true. They can sometimes slow down your connection. You can really tell when you fire it up, and then things take a dive. But ExpressVPN is always blazing fast and lets me and you, everyone, stream videos in HD quality with zero buffering. Aside from the great security also, John, is that this is so easy to use. I mean, you really don't need any technical skills if you know how to use your mobile device or if you know how to use your PC, and I know that you do, just fire up the app and tap the one button to connect. That's it, it's that easy. And that's all you need to do to be safe and secure and quickly as possible. And it's not just me saying this. Mashable, The Verge, and many other high-tech journals rate ExpressVPN as the number one VPN in the world so that with one touch, you too can make sure that you're not breached by a John Champion on your own ad. So protect yourself with the VPN that we use and trust to prevent, you know, an unexpected John Champion from crashing. Use our link, expressvpn.com slash mission log today and get three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn, E-X-P-R-E-S-S, vpn.com slash mission log. Visit expressvpn.com slash mission log to learn more. And now you can have your show back. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. I feel like uh, there's this implied domestic violence angle. You know, Tom, you slapped me really hard and you hurt me when you grabbed my arm. That's super uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I know just last week I was talking about fledgling scriptwriters having to fit into the format of the show they're pitching to or writing for, which means fitting into certain societal norms. But this is not something I can carve out a special pleading for. You know, I can't, I can't defend that as a societal norm at all. I have an album of Raymond Scott commercials and jingles from the 50s. Raymond Scott was a famous jazz band leader, but he also dabbled in early electronic music like radiophonic stuff before the BBC Radiophonic Workshop was a thing. And it reminds me of this wild turn of phrase from one of the tracks on that album, which for the record is Manhattan Research Incorporated, uh, where this announcer says, don't beat your wife every night. The emphasis on every. It's like, yeah, give her Mondays off. How about don't beat your wife at all? I just, some of this stuff I can't abide. Don't beat your wife every night, which basically implies every other night? I mean, that is really weird. I, 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 wow. Just wow. You know, it was, it was more discussed, you know, after the police left and then, you know, Tom and Olga, they kind of, they again dropped the pretense of uh, being a a happy couple. It was just a misunderstanding. It was a nightmare, et cetera. Uh, We never actually did see like the, the physicality of that. So I'm wondering if that's a way to get that implied violence through the, the censors of the time, because Mm -hmm. this is like that age old debate right now is whether it should be told or seen, you know, whether it should be in camera or in mind. And maybe that uh, it leads more to the uh, assumption that there's something else going on when you, the audience member sitting on the couch in 1954, watching the black and white TV with basically your single focus on watching the story see that this is being described and you're like, oh, wow, I wonder how hard, I wonder how, how much he wrenched her arm. I wonder if that's the only way that he can, he can get away from, you know, basically snapping awake at, in the middle of the night, bearing down like the, the knife edge of his psychotic wife. Does it lead more credence to his behavior early on 
because it's implied, because people were thinking about it, and because they were using their imagination more than actually seeing it executed, you know, in action as an action's part of the of the scene. Yeah, well, it kind of goes back to you know the age old saying that the best special effects in the business are in radio drama, and because the audience is having to do all the work for you, right. And, you know, your, your Foley artists are, are doing a little bit of the work, but the rest of it is all happening in the listener's head. And really, at this time in TV drama, we have just turned the corner away from radio and toward TV. And in some instances, whether it is to skirt the censors, like you were saying, which I think that is a very valid, that that's something I hadn't even thought of, is to get it past, you know, whatever whatever the 1954 version of standards and practices was. And, you know, also because we are used to talking about things and not showing them. Because showing them, that's expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like, kind of like I was saying about, you know, oh, we're going to find an airplane factory for the first episode. It's like, we're going to find a what? Right. For how much? And a hospital for the second episode. Yeah, but, you know, it... Any old office will do. Just make sure there's a nurse back there. Right. Just one. One is all you just need. One. That's all you got in the budget. And, you know, I, I wanted to, I'm, I'm going to flip my script here a little bit because uh, I wanted to bring this point up a little bit later, but it dovetails into kind of like this, the assumption of what an audience member would be watching or listening to in this case, because I think that there is an intended bias that I read when Garrett was talking about this particular scene, his voiceover in this particular scene. So this is on page 16. This is for reference. I know that you out there don't have this script in front of you. On page 16, scene 28, this has continued. Garrett in voiceover. Olga Durant, 32 years, charming, poised, well-educated. It's hard to believe she's a homicidal maniac. Now, that's black and white type. And you can only... You can only uh, infuse your own emotional response to that as you're reading it. So do you think the voiceover lends to creating a bias towards Olga when Garrick says homicidal maniac, meaning that he believes as such at this point in time? Or is he trying to convince us, the audience, or maybe convince himself that she's not because he's saying she's 32 years old, she's charming, she's poised, she's well-educated. It's hard to believe she's a homicidal maniac as opposed to it's hard to believe that she's a homicidal maniac. It's like there's this, these are the fact or the sarcasm of it. And it's about how the lines performed, how the emphasis is dropped. It's all about the intent. So, I mean, I haven't seen this episode as the episode. How did you read that, Earl? I, I really think that this is Garrett trying to keep an open mind and not trying to form any conclusions up front. And yet at the same time, again... You're fighting the societal norms at the time. Women did not have it good mm -hmm. in this country, possibly in any other country as well. I wasn't there. I don't know. But stuff like these little context clues, that may have been what the societal expectation was at the time. But, you know, you just shake your head now. But, yeah, I think in, to some extent he is trying to keep a balanced view of what's going on and not draw any conclusions because that's not necessarily his job until evidence just piles up to an overwhelming degree. Right. You know, a lot of times it was kind of like Klingon was playing his devil's advocate. And he's like, oh, this has got to be Tom's fingerprints on the knife. He's like, well, we haven't proven that yet. So, you know, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying as district attorney, as a you know, representative of the law. I have to get all the facts, ma'am, if you will. By the way, we did mention police squad. We mentioned that we would come back to that point. Pretty much every single voiceover in this style, I can't hear, but being performed by the late and legendary Leslie Nielsen. It's hard to believe she's a homicidal maniac. Right. And where the hell was I? <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere I went, something reminded me of her. And they like walks by a department store display of like the newest butcher knives a bunch of shop window dummies with butcher knives <laughs> of course that's the way that it would do it <laughs> something that it did kind of uh pop into my head seeing kind of this addressed early on in in a gene script and uh, seeing it tie through later on into uh, the wagon trains to the stars some of the episodes there Mental illness, the, the aspect of mental illness represented in, in Gene's story. So there is a scene where Garrett 
says both to, uh, I think it's to Tom and Olga, but especially Olga at this time. He says that I still say from the facts that as you've given them to me, your wife should have received clinical treatment long ago. Tom said, there must be some way besides an asylum. I'm afraid of the shame and ridicule would cause her mind to snap completely. And Garrett said, I think you should both get one thing straight. The mind is just as liable to sickness as any other organ and just as curable. Shame shouldn't enter into it any more than if she had a stomach ailment. There's an interesting directness to that. And maybe at the time, that's as as clear and as blunt as you can make an observation of mental illness. But I do like that Garrett saying, you have to address this. You can't just sugarcoat it or sweep it under the rug. That's not how this works. Only proper treatment is how this works. Is an asylum the proper treatment? That's... That's a whole other debate that I think could take us off the rails and into the weeds for an extra day. Right. right. But he does have a point that it does need to be addressed. You can't ignore it, and you can't just turn away from it continually. Elsewhere in scene 103, Tom looks from Garrett to Klingon frantically. And and this is, you know, when his, his number's up and they've figured him out. Mm-hmm. This is at the end. And then, as if trying to convince them, and those are the stage directions, Tom says, do you know what it's like to have unlimited credit except that your wife has to countersign every check? My good man, take a seat. Women couldn't even open their own line of credit without their husband's signature being on it or without their husband knowing about it until the 1970s. -hmm. We're not talking about ancient history. This is within my lifetime. You know, I'm glad that you brought that up, Earl, because... Looking at the script and then at the very end, you know, with with Tom's confession of this is how he feels and this is the motivation why he tried to set up killing his wife and her psychosis as his alibi. It really lent into what I believe is this balancing act, at least in 1954 and probably still even today, of male social emasculation versus female gaslighting. Or not even versus, but maybe working hand in hand, but which one is actually the predominant reason versus the secondary reason. I read this article from Case Western Reserve University, and this was posted in October 25th, 2016. And the research paper was written by Caitlin Barnes Langendorfer. I want to make sure that those credits are there. I have taken excerpts from this article and wanted to focus on how they apply to Durant's motivation and the systemic takedown of his wife, Olga, through gaslighting. So Langendorfer states that older men adhere closely to an idealized masculinity script that is incompatible with the realities of later life. As men age, they continue to follow dominant ideas of masculinity learned as youth, leaving them unequipped for the assaults of old age, according to a new study. This masculinity script still embraced by older men, was outlined as the four-part blueprint of manhood first published by sociologist Robert Brannan when the men in the studies were entering adulthood in the 1970s. The blueprint included these four points. No sissy stuff. Men are to avoid being feminine, show no weaknesses, and hide intimate aspects of their lives. The big wheel. Men must gain and retain respect and power and are expected to seek success in all they do. Remember that one. The sturdy oak. Men are to be the strong, silent type by projecting an air of confidence and remaining calm no matter what. Give him hell. Men are to be tough, adventurous, and never give up and live life on the edge. Now take this, uh, this excerpt of this article, and then I want to also make a specific point of the gaslighting that's going on. Now for those of you who are not familiar with the term or need a refresher course, Gaslight, the term gaslighting comes from a 1944 American psychological thriller directed by George Cukor, but it was adapted from Patrick Hamilton's play Gaslight in 1938. And the descriptor is a play set in 1880s London, written by the British novelist and playwright Patrick Hamilton. Hamilton's play is a dark tale of, wait for it, folks, maybe you've heard this one before, maybe in this episode. A marriage based on deceit and trickery and a husband committed to driving his wife insane in order to steal from her. Now you have the toxic masculinity and the masculation from the article that I mentioned 
and you have the definition of exactly what's happening in this episode through gaslighting as defined by the, the history and the etymology of that word. So was this expected to be understood by the male audience of the 1950s when this quote unquote idealized masculinity script was the standard as to how men believe they should behave? Because, and you said this before, we weren't there, but we have seen time and again in the entertainment of that era that this may be the case, or we can make the case for this, not necessarily understand it, but at least categorize it as such. How did you, how did you feel about how these points weigh in on your understanding of the script? I, I went back and reread that several times. And I have so many different responses, and I'm trying to trying to mentally narrow down the ones that are applicable to this story. And I, I think you're definitely onto something, but, you know, my mind keeps kind of going off into the weeds thinking about how many lives have been prevented from being their best lives by guys blindly following that script. And yet, once again, the the normalized behavior of society at these periods, which you're talking about a study of, you know, men in the 1970s, it, inheriting these values from the 1950s. Mm -hmm. How much can you even begin to calculate the damage that this masculinity script has done over time? The, the sticking point in my interpretation of this story is, is Gene belittling Tom Durant for this mindset? Or is he to some extent, upholding and supporting this mindset. Because he, like everyone else his age at that time, would have been raised with this same set of values. And so it's like, okay, is he is he saying, oh, this, this guy has something of a point, or is he saying, oh, this guy's pathetic? Going back to the mission statement of what we're doing here, you know, we're trying to understand and see kind of like the three lines of Gene Roddenberry now to Gene Roddenberry, you know, uh, later on when he's produced, you know, some of his more famous works. And I'm thinking that if this was the beginning of Gene Roddenberry being able to, quote unquote, subvert the expectations of the audience, I'm wondering if his script is just asking the question. It's neither supportive of or vilifying. Because I think that that's where this, the success in his writing has always been. It's just this this ambiguity of who you are, where you are, and how you're receiving and interpreting and digesting this information at the time. Do you side with a Tom Durant or do you side with Olga and understand what Garrett is saying about this woman is being systematically dismantled, you know, mentally and financially? You know, let me sum it up in one way. So I want to coin a critique from Gene's pilot of that famous space western that he created was the writing even for 1954 and even from a very young Gene Roddenberry was this writing too cerebral and maybe it didn't land the way it was intended because the audience of the time or at least perhaps the men that were watching this episode they were still living life under the auspices of those four specific points that I mentioned earlier yeah, it would be sad to think that there were guys in the audience who, you know, sat up like once upon a time in Hollywood going, aha, mm -hmm. that guy's me. And it's, you know, I guess if you're if you're a successful writer, you're leaving enough open to the audience's interpretation and imagination that that may be an inevitable outcome. And, you know, perhaps that's the difference between Gene's early works and his later works. Well, just like Mission Log, just like our standard Mission Log podcast, at the very end, we take a look at an episode and see what we can mine from the morals and meanings and messages of Gene Roddenberry's work. Albeit, this is the earliest forms of Gene Roddenberry's work, but let's start with Earl. We have unpacked a lot of stuff. We still have many things to discuss. So let's see how we feel about the coming to the conclusion of Script 22B, or more importantly now as it was properly titled, Wife Killer. 
Dude, I'm I'm still unpacking. In fact, I've got this whole other suitcase right here. <laughs> I'm gonna open it up right now. Give me a sound and, effect for uh, that. I, what is the message of this episode? I, I can't even land on one. Part of me wants to say, you know, make sure you listen to the victims. I don't think that really applies here because, again, because we're dealing with societal norms of the 1950s. And I need to find a better way to to put that because I don't want anyone to start calling you societal norm. I don't mind. I think that's actually kind of cool. That might be my new handle. Your yeah, it might be your it might be your cover band, mm-hmm. societal norm, and the wife killers. <laughs> Let's scratch that one. Maybe we'll not. table that one. Yes. Yeah. Gra- yeah. Okay. Never mind. Olga can't even speak out openly about being a victim. It, the script doesn't show it, but it tells us he's literally struck her. Mm-hmm. It, but it gets worse from there. Even Klingham, the police officer, has a line that's just a stone's throw away from, ah, dames, am I right? Just, oh, can we get Sergeant Riker back? I liked him better. How is Olga supposed to get anyone to listen to her through this kind of signal-to-noise ratio? But, again, returning to what we were talking about in the discussion, here is a message that I can definitely take away from this and something that I feel very strongly about because of things that I've run into in my own life. We are in an ever-changing world. Your masculinity does not hang on whether or not you are the breadwinner. And let me say it again for those of you in the back. Your masculinity is not pinned to your income or whether or not you have brought in, you know, the biggest number in your household. We talked in the previous episode about toxic masculinity, and here's another symptom of it. Tom is ready to murder his wife because he feels like not being the man of the house is somehow taking something away from him. But they're not starving. They're not in danger of losing the house. What with its, you know, custom in-floor wiring to shock the doorknobs and everything. And, you know, trust me, that's going to look really good when this house goes up on Zillow Gone Wild. I say this as someone who was a stay-at-home dad to an infant and then a toddler, and someone who took a lot of crap for it. If Tom's masculinity is that fragile, he is the one who needs a mental health intervention, not Olga. Although, I dare say, she is now going to need some heavy-duty counseling, because she almost got gaslighted or or gaslit to death. Almost actually, literally, based on the story. And... and... (laughs) The thing is with Olga is like, where does she go now? Who does she turn to now? Because I don't think that her problem's been solved. It's just Tom has been put away. That's all. But the damage has been done. You know, I, I'm, I'm very similar, you know, when it comes to kind of like where I landed with this from a morals meetings and messages perspective. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, bring up a quote from a movie that has always stuck with me about this type of breakdown between the, the stoicism of kind of like the male ego of the past versus when this particular movie came out. So when Tom Durant confessed to the end, uh, at the end, what his motivations were for doing what he did to Olga, it reminded me a lot of what Sylvester Stallone's Rambo said at the end of First Blood, you know, when he surrendered to Colonel Troutman. So he felt despair coming back home because in the Vietnam War, He was a Green Beret. He was a man of action and a renowned soldier. You know, check off points like one or two, like in the the top four that we talked about in discussion. Quote, back there, I could fly a gunship. I could drive a tank. I was in charge of million dollar equipment. Back here, I can't even hold a job parking cars. That's where he was. That's where this male... Uh, the, the male toxicity and the fragile ego syndrome has driven Rambo. So I get it, right? I don't, I don't excuse it and I don't understand it, but I get it because just like you shared her, I'm going to share a little bit of something too. I chose to come here, you know, uh, to, to live in this new life to help my partner take care of her mom. But I gave up a high powered salary. I gave up a high powered career. I left a lot of that behind, but I don't regret it because I understand why I did it. What I don't understand is Tom saying that he he's losing or has lost a a sense of personal worth as a man. 
because he's not in charge of that financial independence. And I understand. I get that financial independence is important to everyone, you know, but I can see why maybe in the 1950s and the way that Gene maybe proposed it, why a man like Tom Durant would have chosen this. But that also makes him the criminal. And I think that that can't be understated. Seeing Tom for what he was and what he did maybe was societal and the societal norm of the time. He was ashamed. He was embarrassed. You know, his masculinity was challenged and exposed. But maybe that was the point that Gene wrote, that this doesn't have to be the blueprint of a responsible, respected male figure, right? So so then he would have maybe been perceived as the victim in some way by some in the audience. And the way that society saw him at large as maybe how society in general failed one of their own, one of their own men. Because, you know, again, that male stature was of the time a certain perception. But now, if we watched it today, if this story was told today, maybe Durant got what, exactly what he deserved. Put that aside, though. I just wish that Olga and the Olgas of today got the justice they deserved. But maybe one day we'll see the vision of that other famous show of Gene Roddenberry when it becomes a reality where we would see justice for Olga and maybe sooner than later, much sooner than later. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because you think about this 1954, we are 10 years away from the cage and Pike talking to Dr. Boyce about his feelings and the fact that he's thinking about retiring and that you know, Starfleet isn't the end-all and be-all of his existence for him. And so, you know, maybe this is a point on a curve where Gene is talking about redefining the basic contours of being a man and being a man who's a leader. Mission Log Genealogy is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Special thanks to the Roddenberry Repertory Players. Our cast this week featured John Krikorian as District Attorney Paul Garrett and Mike Richards as Klingham. If you would like to support us directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash mission log for early access to shows and the Mission Log Discord. If you have any material that might be of interest to us that isn't already in the Roddenberry archive, drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com. Our website is is missionlogpodcast.com On the next episode Police Academy We'll be back next week with more of your favorite programs This concludes our broadcast day This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.